Hi there, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jeff Wilson, president of Novametrics Research. Today, we're going to be talking about a thing called community network integration, what it is, how it can benefit you and your organization, and how to get started, including a few examples. Novametrics is a global social enterprise that focuses on the process of integrating stakeholder networks for solutions in population, environmental, and animal health. We developed the process of Community Network Integration, or CNI, as a means for anyone, including yourself, to enter the rapidly growing collaborative economy. Now, the collaborative economy has been called the third industrial revolution, and it's believed by many people that its impact will actually eclipse that of the industrial revolution. We're all familiar with the disruptive impact of companies like Uber and Airbnb. Well, it turns out that that level of transformation is about to spread throughout the entire global economy. But unlike Uber, the next waves of collaborative enterprises won't be owned by individual corporations. They'll be run by all of us collaboratively. We started this process in earnest around 2014. It started as a handful of projects. It's now grown into a global enterprise. We're on five continents globally, and we're working on issues as diverse as pollinator health and experiential learning. And we're integrating networks at the local, national, and global levels. We have a whole range of collaborators, uh, everything from government agencies like the Public Health Agency of Canada, global co corporations like Merck, Cargill, Elanco, and so on, small businesses, NGOs, multiple universities around the world, the media, and the public at large. We'll be giving you a bunch of examples of those later on in the case studies near the end of this presentation. Now, we're all aware of the idea of stakeholder networks, and a lot of us have been involved in network activities. So for example, being part of a steering committee or being part of a public discussion on an issue that's important in your community and that sort of thing. Even voting can be viewed as a form of network interaction. There's a critical distinction though. Although network activities are common, truly integrated networks that focus on aligning stakeholders effectively in a way that optimizes everybody's outcomes are exceedingly rare. The collaborative economy is emerging at this point in human history precisely because it holds the promise of everybody benefiting and participating in its management and leadership. This uh, slide shows some of the differences between conventional networks and integrated networks. Primary among these is that conventional networks tend to be highly siloed. They have some level of connectivity between stakeholder groups, but it's usually far from complete. And that often invo involves or results in groups within the networks with similar worldviews aligning with each other and opposing those that have different worldviews. Integrated networks, by contrast, are, in, are connected throughout. The primary reason for the siloing of conventional networks really is fragmented leadership. There is generally no leadership of the whole, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, which does exist in integrated networks. Now that lack of cohesive network leadership often results in a range of outcomes that hurt virtually everybody in the network. So for example, it results in the limited self-interest of players um, creating a failure to understand and even appreciate other people in the network. Well, naturally this leads to things like suspicion, positioning, secrecy, as opposed to listening to other people, finding out what they want and building collaborative solutions together. It can result in things like duplication of effort, competing for the same resources and so on. And the result is often that the results are disappointing. In contrast, in integrated networks, collaborative leadership of the whole, and that's key, results in a common vision where everybody wins. The focus is on creating a culture of trust across the network, authentically and transparently. And as a result, it's possible to identify and eliminate redundancies in the network. So things where time and, and money are being wasted by people doing the same activities and not even being aware that other people are doing it. And it allows us to focus on actually growing the pie for everyone, not fighting over a shrinking pie. The result is, is essentially limitless scalability of creating value for people across the network. Incidentally, and this is key, CNI doesn't seek to replace existing network collaborations. We have no interest in doing that. It simply assists in connecting and optimizing them. 
Community network integration simply takes existing networks and transforms them so they work better for everybody. Like this slide says, it's a systematic process to align stakeholders to create solutions that are impossible otherwise. Solutions to things like economic prosperity, health, environmental sustainability, and so on. By aligning the stakeholders, that is by having them come together in a state of cooperation, it's possible then to take collective action, usually in the form of scalable pilot projects that advance everybody's interest. Well, then having aligned our stakeholders, it's possible to, to create then a platform, an ongoing process of alignment to create solutions to many issues over time. And finally, all of this is done under a third party governance structure. No one organization or person owns or runs the process. Together, we run it collaboratively through participatory decision making. Understanding how this all works usually happens bit by bit, like peeling back the layers of an onion. And it kind of depends on your personality and life experience. You may understand this immediately, or it may take some time. In this presentation, we'll be explaining more and giving some examples, and there'll be lots more information to come over time. At the end of the day, though, you'll find that the best way to understand this is, become, is by becoming directly involved in the process in a way that drives your interests. CNI is different from conventional network processes that you might be familiar with, even though the words used to describe both types can sound the same. So we came up with this little metaphor to help make that distinction. Well, in 1969, the first humans land, landed on the moon. The process that got them there was highly coordinated and it involved thousands of people from different backgrounds, all working together under a massive budget and with the support of an entire nation to achieve a single clear objective. Notice that's very different from thousands of people doing things consistent with getting to the moon, like studying men and moons or firing off rockets and spending billions of dollars in a disconnected way. That won't get you to the moon. And unfortunately, it's the way that most conventional stakeholder networks work today. What will get you to the moon is doing many of those same things, but under an integrated leadership framework where everybody's needs are met through coherent plans and action, having collective buy-in. Well, that leads us to the first major breakthrough offered by CNI. It adds what's missing in virtually all conventional networks, a coherent business process for the whole network. So together we can actually lead and manage our collective activities. If you doubt the value of that, think about any issue in the world that you think is important and ask yourself, is anyone actually in charge of leading this? Is anyone actually bringing together all the required stakeholders and, and helping them to craft clever solutions? I guarantee you that in virtually every case, they're not. If you look at the list of elements in, in this slide, you'll see that they're, they're the same things you see in effective management of what we call enterprises, things like companies, non-governmental organizations, universities, and so on. CNI simply adds these things that work so well in enterprises, which themselves are simply networks, to distributed stakeholder networks. There's one big difference though, whereas enterprises are run as hierarchies with someone in charge at the top and everyone reporting back to them, stakeholder networks are distributed. There's no hierarchy and no way to force people to do what you want. Instead, they're co-led through a process of participatory decision-making. Well, that brings us to the second breakthrough offered by CNI, and that is the transparent application of known principles of social psychology to bring stakeholders together to work collaboratively. It turns out there have been some amazing breakthroughs in the psychology of engagement in recent years. That's a study in itself, and we'll be providing some information in later videos about how it works. But for now, here are a couple of examples. First of all, it's important to bring the right people together in the right order. Many conventional networks are brought together by selecting people based on the power they hold, the money they contribute, the people they represent, and so on. Little thought usually is given to their psychological makeup. The result is often an environment of what we call low emotional energy, things like conflict, ego, control, and so on. It turns out that it's almost impossible neurologically to come up with creative solutions in that kind of environment. So what tends to happen is more of the same with seemingly intractable problems extending over decades. CNI takes a very different approach. We specifically begin 
by engaging people across the network who have a psychological propensity already for, collab for collaboration. We call them early adopter collaborators. In, a, in adopter curve theory, these are the people who are at the left end of the bell curve in this figure. They're naturally collaborative and high energy, and when you bring them together, they want to create solutions that help everybody, and they want to bring in the next layers of people in the adopter curve. The result tends to be an upward spiral of engagement and creative problem solving, and the creation of a circle of trust, like in this figure. An ever-expanding group of people who are interested in each other's positions, they're actually interested in what the other people think, and they want to build a cohesive community because they know for everybody to win and for them to win, everybody else has to win as well. CNI is specifically designed to create benefits for each stakeholders, the benefits that they really want to achieve. That's another part of the psychology involved. For business, of course, that tends to be things like improving their brand, rather improving sales, obviously, and retaining top talent. You can imagine there are, there are endless ways to do that within the CNI framework, especially when you apply a bit of creativity. But for now, imagine that for a company to be involved in an ever-growing circle of trust that includes their customers and key opinion leaders, all working together to improve everyone's economic situation, including the company itself, while at the same time developing creative solutions for social and environmental issues, which of course helps their brand, there are tremendous opportunities to do exactly what business wants, brand sales and talent retention, among other things. The same applies to government agencies and NGOs as in this figure. Better PR, better co-funding opportunities, better staff engagement, better policy decisions. Because if you're in government or an NGO, the key people for you are in your circle of trust, your clients and stakeholders, your funders, senior managers, political figures, the public and the media. For academic institutions, there's an additional benefit. Because students are a part of the network, CNI creates great opportunities for them to develop what they want, which is a big part of it is developing their careers. By linking them to people who can coach them in, in entrepreneurial skills to get into the network, and we'll have more of that in, in, in uh, one of the examples later on, and linking them to the very people who can ultimately hire them. Now, if you're thinking anything like, I don't have time for this, or this would never work in my organization, or we don't have the budget, we have some good news for you. Part of CNI is harnessing the new economy. Take a look at this figure. On the left, old economy thinking says, I don't have time. New economy thinking uses power time management, things like identifying people in the network that are already doing what you want to do or want to do what you want to do and do it for you. Old economy says we don't have the budget. New economy identifies co-funding opportunities and cost savings through the network. Old economy says we don't have the staff. New economy finds the very people you want to help you because it helps them to help you. It builds your staffing, if you will, through the network. New economy uses state-of-the-art engagement strategy and no-limit thinking. The result is a creative flow state where results emerge rather than killing yourself by working harder, not smarter. You end up living in a state of increasing ease as opposed to one of stress, which is where a lot of people are working in this day and age. Like we said, understanding CNI is kind of like peeling back the layers of an onion, but this figure will give you a high level view of how it works in seven easy steps. And we'll have, have a couple of examples in a moment or so. We're assuming here that you already have identified an issue that's important to you and your network. It could be anything from improving your quarterly results for you and your team to addressing global climate change. Step one is to map the relevant stakeholders, to simply identify the different people who are impacted by this issue in your organization and outside your organization. So for the latter, people in business value chains, government at all levels, academia, NGOs, the media, and the general public. Step two is to engage the early adopters, the ones like we talked about who are naturally collaborative. Like we said, there are a number of elements in the engagement process, but the fact that you're starting with the early adopters is one of the most important, as is step three, 
talking to them individually about what their needs are. What do they want to achieve? And also letting them know who else you are engaging or intend to engage. When you do that, you engage the power of what's called social proof. People are highly interested in being part of something that they see as uh, see others in their network becoming engaged in. Step four is usually to create some small leadership teams. So from these early adopters across the network, you choose initial leadership teams of about six or eight people representing the different interests in your network. What we do is hold informal 90 minute meetings, often they're by Skype or by phone. If people are located you know, at distant locations, we introduce everyone, we get their thoughts on initial pilot projects that will address common issues in a way that drives their interests. So the pilot project is step five. It might consist of gathering more information or running a field test about an idea. The exact pilot project will emerge from your discussions. So talk about how to, what you want to do, how to do it inexpensively and easily. And where if you need funding or other resources, talk about where those resources might exist and where they could come from. After a few more meetings, a, a written plan will start to emerge and we recommend you get that online in something like Google Docs so people can share it and, see, and, and contribute to it, be engaged in it as it emerges. Step six is simply to execute the pilot and publicize the results to your network. There's a whole bunch of ways to, to do that. Um, publicizing, of course, everything from sending emails to social media to media to what have you. Usually that PR is of value to the people involved in the network project because it demonstrates their success and it engages more people in the network and engages more resources for the next pilot or issue. And that's step seven to repeat the process and scale. Now for a couple of examples. The CNI projects we've been involved in have taken two different forms, basically. The first type focuses on an issue of importance to a broad network of stakeholders and often over a wide geographic area. Our example here of that kind is, is around honeybee sustainability. The second type consists of working in a geographic community like a, a city or a town or a township um, and helping engage in the network and helping them identify the issue that they want to work on. Our second example, providing entrepreneurial skills to students is one of those. We began working on honeybee health around 2014 in the province of Ontario in Canada. Now, as with many parts of the world, a key issue for the honeybee network has been colony decline, how bad it is, what's causing it and what to do about it. There have been a lot of theories focusing on things like pesticides, environment and climate change, bee management practices and so on, and combinations of the above. Honeybee sustainability is a classic example of how a complex issue can often only be resolved by bringing together the right stakeholders. Beekeepers understand their bees, of course, but they can't muster the scientific clout or the funding alone to determine the cause of something as complex as colony decline and certainly not to the degree that they could by engaging other stakeholders in the network, like universities, crop commodity groups, and so on. Now, on the other hand, pesticide manufacturers have tremendous financial resources and expertise that can be brought to the table, but they lack the credibility with the public, beekeepers, politicians, and so on, because they have a vested interest or a perceived vested interest in solving their, or rather in selling their products. Beekeepers need to work with farmers to place their hives and a lot of crops need bees to pollinate them. So everything in this issue is interrelated. The problem is that failure to align the stakeholders over a long period of time has resulted in polarization, polarization rather of those stakeholders, certainly in Ontario, but also in other parts of the world. Now to begin addressing this issue of colony decline, we began just like we talked about in the slide set by mapping the network. On this slide, you can see in the bottom right, logos from a bunch of the different players that we talked to. We approached each stakeholder individually and we just showed them how their primary needs around honeybee decline. So for a beekeeper, the, you know, the sustainability of their bees and their profitability for the uh, pesticide people, the ability to, to um, credibly uh, show the value of their products and the sustainability of their products, 
that that could only be addressed if we work together transparently, and that's key, and authentically. Well, it turned out they thought that was a good idea. So all of them gave us combinations of letters of support, their expertise, their time, some gave funding, some gave data, and connectivity to other people within the network to support a field study to determine the causes of colony decline. Interestingly, this had never been done in Canada, partly because the approach was at, the, at that time outside the scope of the honeybee community. What we did was simply bring in the expertise, the methodology from people working on similar field studies in, a, in other animal species and in humans. And we apply that to bees. A good example of creatively harnessing the power of the network to create solutions not previously possible. The results were pretty interesting. There was no evidence, for example, of an association between proximity of hives to corn crops, where corn is the main crop that's been incriminated in, in uh, the potential for, for pesticides to cause harm to bees. There was no uh, relationship between that proximity and colony losses, but there were significant and multiple associations between colony losses and things like honeybee management and honey and beekeeper experience. That was contrary to prevailing thought in some parts of the network, but it turns out it was consistent with other field studies conducted globally that began to emerge. The results suggest the value of refocusing research efforts and policy to better understand the cause of colony decline and reduce it. But even more importantly, the results showed the value to the network of collaborating effectively. It ultimately spawned interest in, in at a national and global levels in the use of CNI to create a honeybee sustainability solutions platform. And already there's interest in connecting that or expanding that to eco, ecosystem biodiversity as a whole, because of course, many of the issues that affect bees in agroecosystems also affect other plant and animal species. Now, our second example involves a community response to another, another issue rather that affects many of us, underemployment of university and college graduates. Now, obviously, post-secondary institutions provide amazing training in the content of different disciplines. How to criticize a piece of literature, for example, or fix a car or sequence a gene. But they tend to provide much less training in what we call entrepreneurial and life skills. The result is, an, is a growing employment gap, especially among university graduates and among them, especially graduates of the humanities, some basic sciences and so on. It turns out in the, in the new economy, there are few traditional jo jobs available for these students in spite of the value of the skills and the education they received and little training for them in how to integrate those skills into the economy. And for the most part, universities lack key components of these skills. That's not surprising because many professors are academic superstars who didn't need to develop these skills themselves. Our approach to the issue was to create a model whereby any student can develop a career path for their chosen area of study. We tested it on ourselves and then we tested with multiple students from different disciplines. It's based on information that's not widely known in the university environment. A lot of it came from adapting practical sales skills, marketing skills, and things used in entrepreneurial business. So it doesn't tend to be even in business schools, this kind of thinking doesn't tend to be that easily accessible. And as you can see from the figure, when it's applied to students and their careers, it covers topics think, uh, from uh, identifying your passion, managing your emotions, like your confidence, uh, mapping your network appropriately and effectively, identifying getting the right training, the internships, the volunteer experiences and so on, and connecting the right people to nail your first job or contract. We're now in the process of further mapping and engaging the right networks to scale the process. That includes connecting with entrepreneurs who have these skills and want to share them. Developing a scalable online training and, and community process. Linking to universities and colleges because they have a tremendous amount to offer in this area when linked to the network. For example, harnessing their faculty and their experiential learning processes and programs to scale the response 
And finally, connecting to corporate and government funders and enablers who benefit from connecting to students in the circle of trust because those students are future customers, of course, they're future employees, and because helping students in this way supports their corporate brand. Before we finish, there's one more takeaway we'd like to offer. The collaborative economy isn't just a nice to have that will happen if some people decide to create it. This is a global social movement whose time has come. With the internet and the realization by millions of people that they can empower themselves by organizing and through learning, and with the huge economic benefit to business, the collaborative economy is an inevitability. Our only question to you is, would you rather lead or would you rather follow? Here are a few ways that we can help you connect to your networks and harness the power of the collaborative economy. We've made it our business to understand how it works and to develop, as far as we know, the first coherent scalable process for anybody to do so. We help networks thrive by assisting with all the things we mentioned in this PowerPoint. So things like mapping and engaging network partners, assisting with developing co-funding opportunities, developing pilot projects, including the required data frameworks, and providing training in how to do all of this. So the next step is probably to talk with you about how this can work for you and answer any of your questions. So we look forward to the opportunity to do that. So with that, many thanks for taking the time to listen, and we'll look forward to connecting soon.